Thank you, choir, for giving us just a snippet of what next week is going to be like. So be sure and come back and uh, listen to them uh, share the gospel in music with us uh, next week on Palm Sunday. If you have your Bibles, please open to Luke chapter 19. As you can see, we've skipped forward for this special occasion. Luke chapter 19, and if you'll just leave them open, uh, because I'm going to go further than what I'm going to do in the initial reading, and uh, you can try to keep up with me if you can. Luke chapter 19, beginning in verse 37. Then as he, that is Jesus, was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he, Jesus, answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Uh, This next Sunday is Palm Sunday. Uh, Next Sunday our choir will be preaching the cross and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ through music. But this Sunday, I wanted to share a message uh, on the significance of the cross of Christ in order to prepare our hearts for Holy Week uh, that we celebrate and commemorate uh, beginning next Sunday. Uh, Holy Week begins with the scriptures that I just read. In Luke chapter 19, verse 37, you see the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem where he is fulfilling a prophecy from Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 9, Behold, your king will come to you riding upon a donkey colt. Also in John chapter 12, verse 13, it mentions people lay down palm branches in the street in order for he and the donkey to make their entrance into the city of Jerusalem as he comes riding into town. That's where we get the term Palm Sunday from, is they were throwing down palms, recognizing Jesus as king. Now, it should be a day of gladness, but there's also a note of sadness when it comes to Palm Sunday because Palm Sunday reminds us of how fickle and faithless and forgetful we can be. For on Sunday, the people sang, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. And by Friday, the people were shouting, Crucify him, he's a criminal. And how many of us have broken faith between Sunday and Friday? As the prophet Hosea said in chapter 6, verse 4 of his book, Our faithfulness is like the morning dew. Like the early dew, it goes away. After Palm Sunday, then, of course, the next day is Monday. We see that in chapter 19 of Luke. Luke 19, 45, 46, Jesus cleanses the temple. He drives out the merchants and the money changers who were buying and selling there in the temple precinct. Then on Tuesday and Wednesday, Jesus was teaching in Jerusalem. Luke chapter 20 and verse 9, he tells a parable of the wicked servants who kill the son of their master. It's kind of ironic, isn't it? Because that's what's actually going to happen before the end of the week. In Luke chapter 20 and verse 27, he teaches about the resurrection of the dead, again, just before it happens. Luke chapter 21, he foretells the future destruction of the temple, how perilous times will follow during the last days, and then he tells about his second coming. In Luke chapter 22 and verse 1, sometime Wednesday, Uh, Judas confers with the chief priest to betray Jesus for 30 measly pieces of silver. And then we have Thursday, uh, Luke 22, 7. The disciples are making uh, preparations for their annual Passover holiday. Uh, Jesus observes Passover. He institutes the Lord's Supper. According to church tradition, uh, this Thursday is referred to as Maundy Thursday. Of course, Maundy is a Latin word that means commandment. And we get the English word mandate because after the meal, uh, Jesus washes the disciples' feet and gives them a new commandment, a new mandate. Do you remember what that is? John 13, 34. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you love one another. A new commandment I give to you, to love one another as I have loved you, that you love one another. And then following the supper, Jesus goes out, Luke 22, 39, and prays in the Garden of Gethsemane. And, of course, by Jewish reckoning, we're already into Friday after sundown on Thursday. So we're already into Friday that church tradition refers to as Good Friday, but was not so good for Jesus. He had done no wrong. He was the sinless Son of God, yet he was arrested, 
endured three mock trials by the chief priest and Pilate and Herod, and then he was scourged, which basically means that they beat him nearly to death, beat him to a pulp, and then he was crucified. That's also why Holy Week is sometimes referred to as Passion Week. When we think of passion, we usually think of a strong emotion like love. But originally, again, the passion came from the Latin word that means to suffer. And in Christ, passion means both. Jesus did love. Jesus loved us so much that he was willing to leave the glories of heaven, come down from his throne, come down to earth, and go to the cross to suffer. Notice the love and the suffering, the penalty for our sins, which is eternal death in a place called hell in order to offer us eternal life in a place called heaven if we would simply put our faith and trust in him. You know, but strangely in our modern world, many people who call themselves Christians no longer believe in hell. Several years ago, I received an email from a man named Roger Tutt, who claimed to be a Christian missionary from Toronto, Canada. I didn't know him, never heard of him. I assumed he got my name from the church website. Uh, anyway, he wrote an email to ask me to stop preaching about hell. Apparently, I was not the only one. I guess he sent this to preachers all over the place. But anyway, he wrote in the email, the idea that God lets any creature suffer endlessly has caused me more suffering than all other problems of my life combined. By the time I had reached the mission field, I had hoped that I had found a satisfactory answer that would justify God allowing this to happen. I didn't find such an answer. I was surrounded by thousands of people, dozens of who were dying every day and beginning an eternity of suffering in hell. That was just too much for me. Roger continues, At the age of 28, it caused me to have a nervous breakdown. For several weeks, I was confined in my bed in a state of terror. Night and day, the terror caused my fear of all uh, of God. I could not love or respect uh, to a God who, who would do this to me after I died. It took me 12 years to fully recover from the breakdown. Many Christian friends tried to help me. I'm sure they meant well, but in the end, they only had words of condemnation towards me. This added more suffering to my already intense suffering. Gradually, I began to learn uh, that there have been a few people in the world that see a different kind of God in the Bible. They see a God who would not let any creature suffer. They see a God in the Bible who would change every second of everyone's suffering into something better, including even the sufferings of Satan. I learned that correctly translated Bible teaches universal transformation, not an endless suffering in hell. I read dozens of books, listened to hundreds of tapes by men who believe this way. Because of this evidence, my panic attacks became less frequent until 12 years after my breakdown, they ceased altogether. Because of the enormous amount of suffering that idea of a endless hell causes in this world, I am asking you, asking me, to stop preaching about hell. And then Roger closes his email with a list of websites that teach universalism. And, of course, universalism is the doctrine that no one perishes in hell and that everybody will ultimately be saved. Let me quickly say I'm sorry about Roger's nervous breakdown. And I am glad he got to feeling better. But let me also say that our mental state does not change reality. A nervous breakdown does not change whether there is a heaven or a hell. For example, if I go and sit on railroad tracks, put on a blindfold and put on my headphones and convince myself that there's no such thing as trains, it does not alter the fact that there still are trains. And if I continue to sit on that railroad track, I'll soon have to deal with about 200 tons of reality. It doesn't change anything, no matter what I think, hope, believe, whatever my opinion is. Likewise, whether or not I believe in heaven or hell does not change the fact that there is a heaven and a hell. I went to a couple of those websites that Roger listed, and sure enough, there are dozens of universalists preaching that God is going to save everyone and that there is no such thing as hell. They quibble over the translation of Hebrew and Greek words for hell, like Sheol, Hades, Gehenna, Tartarus. They quibble over the translation of Hebrew and Greek words like forever, everlasting, and eternal. Uh, they make the point that many modern Bible translations are not using the word hell anymore. For those of you who've got the old King James out there, you have hell in your Bible about 54 times. If you have a new King James, it's only 32 times. If you have an NIV, it's only 13 times. And also, there's some translation that I've never looked at, maybe done by a universalist, a new American Bible that has zero references to hell. 
still, even if you call hell something else, you still got to deal with the fact that wrath occurs in the Bible 194 times. Judgment occurs 186 times. Perish occurs 150 times. Condemnation, 74 times. Lost, 34 times. The pit, 89 times. Lake of fire, five times. You know, these folks can engage in all the proof texting wordplay they want to, but the reality is the Bible does teach that there is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. That's the message of the Bible. You know, think about it for a few moments. If there is no hell, then the Bible makes no sense. Why spend a big old thick book like this warning us against our sin if sin really has no consequences? If there is no penalty for doing wrong? If there is no hell, then the Great Commission makes no sense. Why go do missions? Why go into all the world? Why climb the steeps and cross the waves to tell people that Jesus saves if there's really nothing for Jesus to save us from? If everybody's going to go to heaven, whether they believe in Jesus or not, then why bother people? Let people believe whatever they want to believe in. Let them continue to worship their ancestors or their little Buddhas or their totem poles or their electronic idols, whatever idol they choose, just, just let them do it. Let them continue their material dreams of arts and music and sports and entertainment, pornography and sexual immorality, greed and selfish ambition, drunkenness and addiction. However people choose to go through this world, just leave them be. If there's no heaven, there's no hell. Everybody ultimately ends up in a place of peace that God's prepared for them. Then why even bother these folks? Why upset them? If there is no hell, then the cross of Christ to me makes absolutely no sense. If nobody goes to hell, if everybody goes to heaven, then why, oh why, would the Son of God come down from heaven and suffer the pain and shame and disgrace and the offense of the cross if it really doesn't matter? Now, the reason that Christians focus upon the cross of Christ is because the cross is a graphic reminder that there is a hell. And the man that you see hanging on that cross is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who loves you so much that he came down to die our death and to suffer our hell to keep us from going there if we'll simply put our faith and trust in him. For the next few moments, let us survey the wondrous cross of Jesus Christ. Point number one is when you see the cross, it should remind you that hell is a place of suffering. Crucifixion was designed by the Romans to intensify suffering, to make sure that you suffered long and hard if you dared commit a crime against the Roman government. And you may be wondering, yeah, I know about the cross, Brother Danny, and I see the cross there, and I know it's a place of suffering, but I thought hell was supposed to be hot. So how in the world does uh, cru crucifixion end up giving us a picture of hell fire? Well, I once read a medical description of what crucifixion was like, and they said when you're hanging there on the cross, you can do that pretty well for a little while. But after a few moments, all of a sudden, your arms begin to tremble, and your muscles across, your chest begin to tighten up, and your diaphragm begins to have spasms, and you begin to start to suffocate, and you begin to smother to death, which drives you to push up. That's why the Romans were ingenious. They always bent your knees before they nailed you to a cross so that you had the ability to push up. And when you pushed up against those nails that have been driven through the nerves in your hands and in your feet, then all of a sudden you get a fiery pain that radiates throughout your body. So you literally feel like you are on fire. In addition to that fiery nerve pain, you're also dehydrated from the blood loss, not only from the nails that's been driven through your body, and in Jesus' case, the crown of thorns, but he'd also been beaten to his back was a consistency of hamburger meat before he ever got to that place. And so you begin to be severely dehydrated. So you begin to cry out like the rich man in the story of rich man and Lazarus in Luke chapter 16, the former rich man, he's former once he's in hell, but former rich man cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. And if you'll remember when Jesus Christ was hanging on the cross, John chapter 19 verse 28 records that Jesus cried out, I thirst. He was literally on fire at the cross. Jesus was enduring the fires of hell for you and me. Point number two, when you see the cross, it should remind you that hell is a place of separation. Separation from God 
In Matthew chapter 27, verse 46, it says, About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You know, I've heard people say that they believe Jesus sweated blood in the Garden of Gethsemane because of the dread of the pain of the cross. I don't think so. Matter of fact, if Jesus did, then he wouldn't be practicing what he preached because he told us when we're persecuted for his sake, then what? Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. So I don't think that he was crying and, and uh, sweating out blood because he feared the pain. No, I think something else caused Jesus to fear and tremble in the Garden of Gethsemane, and I believe it was this. For the six hours that Jesus hung on the cross, he would be, according to 2 Corinthians 5, becoming sin for us who knew no sin. A man who had never committed a sin became sin for us. He took all of our sins upon him, and that caused a problem there because God the Father is so holy that he had to turn away. Because back at chapter 1, verse 13 reminds us that God is so holy, he is of purer eyes than to behold evil, and he cannot look on wickedness. So God the Father had to turn away. And God the Son, for the first time in all eternity, the first and only time in all eternity, would be separated from God the Father. And the thought of that stressed Jesus so much that his sweat became as blood. You know, I think, I think we've lost that. I think we've become so immersed in our culture of sin that we have lost the puritanical idea of the exceeding sinfulness of sin. I think we've learned to accept sin. We've even learned to accept the separation that it causes between us and our holy God. I mean, how often do us, we, even Christians, live in our sins for days and weeks and months and years at a time and don't seem to know or don't really care? that that separates us in our relationship from a holy God who made us. If Jesus feared six hours of separation from his heavenly Father, all of us should be fearful of eternal separation from God the Father in a place called hell. Not only separation from God, but also you'll be separated from your friends and loved ones. The Bible teaches that nobody will be your buddy in hell. I know some people say, well, I guess I'll just go to hell because that's where all my buddies are. No, your buddy's not going to bring you any comfort. You're going to only know separation. You'll be separated from your Christian friends who went to heaven. You'll no longer be able to have any interaction with them whatsoever. And all your lost buddies, your ungodly buddies, they're going to be too consumed with their own suffering to even care about yours. So hell is a place of separation remember at the cross luke 23 49 it says all of jesus acquaintances and the women who followed him from galilee stood at a distance and watched him from a distance he was separated from them so at the cross jesus was experiencing the separation of hell Third point, when you see the cross, it should remind you that hell is a comfortless place. Hell is a place where never is heard an encouraging word. You'll never get a word of encouragement if you choose to go to hell. Old Testament book of Isaiah chapter 14 describes the king of Babylon's first day in hell. And of course, in hell, it's a time of role reversals because he's no longer a king. He has no bodyguards. He has no awe, no honor, no respect. No entourage that comes along with him meeting every one of his little needs that he was used to while he's here on earth. Instead, people are making fun of him. They are criticizing him. They are blaming him. They're complaining about him. Matter of fact, they would kill him except for one thing. What? He's already dead. For all eternity. And that's what Jesus Christ is doing. He's dealing with these things too. All the gospels show how Jesus endured insults and ridicule, and cursing. They spat upon him. They mocked him. They made fun of him as he was crucified for us. Point number four. When you see the cross, it should remind you that hell is a place of darkness. Jesus described hell in Matthew twenty-two thirteen 13 as a place of outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jude describes the demons in hell as being reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. John 3, 19, that men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. And if you'll remember there in the middle of Jesus being crucified, enduring the hell for us on a cross, God the Father turned the lights off. 
Luke 23, 44, from the sixth hour, which is about noon, until the ninth hour, which is three o'clock, there was darkness over all the earth. At the cross, Jesus endured the darkness of hell for you and me. Point number five, when you see the cross, it should remind you that hell is an eternal place. You realize there's many ways to execute people. Uh, down through the centuries, there's been stoning and beheading and firing squads and hanging and drowning and poisoning. And now we're in modern times, and so we're so sophisticated, we've added electrocution and lethal injection. You know, most of those are relatively quick ways to die. But the Romans, they had perfected crucifixion as a slow death, as a horrific warning for anybody that wanted to mess with the Roman Empire that this was what you were going to face. You were going to die yeah, a, a terrible death. Uh, you need to think twice about it when you saw somebody hanging on a cross. Because see, on a cross, you were technically alive, but you weren't living. You were actively dying. And it seemed like eternity. Matter of fact, the Bible never refers to hell as anything like eternal life, but they describe it as eternal death. For many people, it took days, days for them to die on a cross. Jesus only took six hours. I think there's a couple of reasons for that. One of those is because of the extreme blood loss that he already had when they beat him down before they ever took him to the cross. But I believe the second one is more theological. I believe it's because of Revelation chapter 13, verse 18, where it says six is the number of a man. The number of a man is six, six, six. Man was created on the sixth day of creation. Man rebelled against God and crucified God's son on the sixth day of the week. And man made such a mess of things that the Lord will destroy the world after six 1,000-year days of history. So the cross demonstrates a man suffering a long, drawn-out death, which illustrates that he was suffering eternal death for you and me. My sixth point is actually just a summary of the others, and that is when you see the cross, it should remind you that there is a literal place called hell. For that, the Bible is clear. I thought I'd give you one last point to make it good and also to make it seven. It's when you see the cross. It should remind you of the love of God. God loves you so much that he provided a way of escape so that you don't have to go to this reality called hell. God loves you so much that in Christ, God actually became a substitute for you. And I don't know how to explain that. Uh, I've studied theology, but I still don't know how to explain how God is three and in one. And that even though God's son went to the cross, we're told in 2 Corinthians that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. So God was in fact substituting for you so that we don't have to endure this place called hell. He suffered, he bled, he died for your sin so that you could have life. He died for you, and you, and you, and you, and me. Romans 5, 8 said, God demonstrated his own love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Yes, folks, the cross of Christ reminds us there is a hell, a hell that's so real and so awful that the Son of God, in his grace and love, would come down and would die in our place to keep us from going there. Folks, that's the good news of the gospel. And that's been summarized in a one verse. All that I just preached this morning has been summarized in one verse. And it's John 3, 16, that God so loved the world, and God so loved you, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him would not perish in a place called hell, but would have everlasting life in a place called heaven. Folks, that's the message of the Bible. Again, universalist or any other cult that you want to put together out there can come up with whatever theory they want to. But that's the message of this book, all 66 little books. All of them joined together here. That's the message of the Bible. That's the message of the gospel. And that's the message of the cross. Now, as we close, I just want to ask you, how are things between you and the Lord this morning? How are things between you and the Lord this morning? Are you saved? Are you sure? Do you know that you know that if you were to die today, that heaven would be your home? 
Can you go back to a place and time? I know sometimes I get some flack about that. But can you go back to a place and time? You don't have to have an exact day, an exact moment. But can you go back to a place and time somewhere where you prayed and asked Jesus Christ to forgive your sins and to come into your heart and save you? If you've never done that, won't you do it while it's still called today? We don't have a promise of tomorrow. All we have, that we know we have, is right here, right now. So if you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, won't you do that? Right here, right now. And maybe you say, well, Danny, I know. I can go back to the place and time I know that I've been saved. Well, well, let me ask you this. Are you concerned about the salvation of your family, of your friends, of your neighbors, of your classmates, of your coworkers? Are you concerned enough to come to this altar and pray for them? Are you concerned enough to tell them the bad news that the wages of sin is death? Are you concerned enough to give them the good news? And that is the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for this season of the year that reminds us of what we ought to have in mind every day. And that is Jesus is our incredible, unspeakable gift that you gave to us so that we don't have to go to this reality called hell, but that we can have an eternity with you in a place called heaven. Not that it's not put up there as some mountain that we have to climb or some ocean that we have to swim across, but it's as near as our heart if we're willing to confess with our sins, ask you to come into our heart and save us and to make you our Savior, make you our Lord by committing our life to you. We pray today, Lord, that you do heart work in this building that only you can do to prepare us for this season of the year when we say thank you for loving us so much that you saved us. Move among us now, Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit, for we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.